Hi, uh, we're here with uh, on June 3rd, 2008, at the Lowell Fairground with Mr. Ron Winger. And uh, he was born July 30th, 1946, and he lives on 1380 North Marble Road. And I'm Tyler Jack, and I'll be the interviewer. Zach Stevens is in charge of the camera. And Kirk Rorick is the Mr. Center. Winger, tell us about when you were growing up, your family, and where, when you were born and where you were born. Well, I was born um, in Grand Rapids there and uh, lived down uh, over toward Dutton until I was 10 years old. Then we moved over by Alaska and I uh, went to school at uh, Caledonia. Grew up on a small farm here. My dad had a 60 acre farm. And primarily, we raised uh, uh, feeder pigs, and uh, that's what we did when I grew up. In, and worked on that 60-acre farm and uh, with my brothers. And uh, from there, I went to Caledonia School and, and got involved in FFA. And uh, of course, pigs were my project in FFA. And it was spent four four years in that. It ended up uh, my senior year being the president of the FFA chapter. Uh, we had one of the top chapters in the state, which Caledonia still is. It's Lowell and Caledonia. Are some of the top ones, so <clears throat> that was a good uh, background for me, and uh, and uh, they had a really good. Um, we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of fun with my, my brothers and I. And uh, I think one of the things that we did back then is we used our imagination and made our own fun. We didn't have 18 million uh, playthings like everybody's got nowadays, so uh, that's not all bad. Okay, um, so you've been in FFA all your life. Um, did you go to any school for farming after? Yeah, I went to Michigan State University for a year and a half, you know, and um, it was it was fine. But I didn't really care for college. I thought I should have stuck out of it. No, you know, I look back. But anyway, from there I got out of there and uh, ended up landscaping, and I did that for. Eight and a half years, I worked for Twin Lakes Nursery, and um, ended up being a foreman for them and ran all the commercial crews. Um, and then my two of my brothers wanted to start farming, so we bought a farm near North of Lowell and uh, moved up here in 1977. And we started milking cows there, so we milked cows for ten years, and um, then we got into the beef and uh, and swine production. And did that, and uh, until all the big feed companies, everybody got into raising hogs and all that stuff. So it kind of took the profit out of that, and uh, that's when I got involved in, the, in working here at the fair. I worked at Ionia Fair for a year, and then ended up over here at Lowell. Uh, can you tell us um, why you only stayed at Ionia for a year? Well, my kids started showing here in nineteen. Uh, I think it was around 1980, and uh, so I was always involved in the fair down here, and I got on the fair board here, and um, and I was on the board, and then I went to work at Ionia, and of course when I worked at Ionia Fair, I didn't have much time to spend here, and the fair board here, I guess, missed me or whatever, because they came and offered me a job here, so I came back to Lowell because this is the one I always started with and liked anyway. Can you uh, tell us about like your experience on the board before you were president? Well, I was on the board for ten years before I became president. Um, started out as the chairman of the buildings and grounds committee, and been on that for the last twenty-five years, I guess. So, um, and when we started out, it wasn't near as big as it is now. Uh, uh, we didn't have as many kids. We didn't have as many activities. Uh, the fair has grown immensely over the last 25 years. We started out, we didn't even have parking. I mean, you just park wherever you wanted because there wasn't, uh, wasn't a need for parking. Now we park clear across up to the river and, and on the other side of the road and have to shuttle people. So that shows you how much has changed. Uh, and we have a lot more kids, a lot more programs. And, you know, we, we didn't even have computers back when we started. Now we got computer programs that they compete with and all kinds of stuff. So. It's changed a lot over the years. Um, 
But the, the good part about the fair is it still has its basics and its traditions. Um, and I call it uh, uh, life skills is what it teaches young people. You take an animal and put it in a cage or you put it or tie it up and you don't take care of it, it's going to die. It teaches you responsibility. You have to take care of it. If you're going to do that, then, then you, you know. And uh, it's not always pleasant. You can only have one winner. Uh, sometimes when you have animals, you have dead animals. I mean, that's life. But it teaches people how to deal with those problems. Uh, and the bottom line is what we're trying to do is we're trying to get young people to be uh, responsible citizens in our society. And I think this is one of the best programs in order to accomplish that. Can you tell us um, about, can you take us like step by step how the fair has changed? Like, you know what I mean? Well, when we started out, like I said, there wasn't near as many um, uh, participants and uh, and we didn't have all the activities that we have now and um, didn't have as many people come to, to view the, the fair either. And uh, I, I was looking in a paper here in 1948 and the uh, um, fair only went for three days it started on Wednesday and on Friday night it was all done you know? and then I remember when I first started coming to the fair with the kids here uh, I mean I came when I was a young person but I didn't show here but when I came with the kids and we were here all week all week we started at uh, came down on Sunday uh, afternoon and there wasn't anybody here and we started hauling stuff in and getting set up and uh, Monday we hauled our animals down and went home on on uh, Saturday afternoon you know well now you come down here on uh, Saturday before fair and this place is just packed and ready uh, we're, we're doing still exhibit judging now uh, we're, we're, uh, dogs are being judged uh, um, Everything's getting set up. People are moving in. Hogs are coming in. Horses are coming in. Um, and then we're here all week, and we don't get out here till 11 o'clock Saturday night. So it's, it's got to be a lot longer, a lot more activities, and a lot more things going on. And, uh, of course, that's what we're here for, to give kids uh, the opportunity to show their, their projects. So um, it's changed a lot over the years uh, as far as more and more things, but we still kept our basic... Uh, a reason to be here and why we're here and that's for young people and uh, we're one of the few youth, truly youth fairs in the state and uh, that's what we want to stay at. How has the, uh, the architecture and the landscape of the, the fair changed since you've... Well, when I first came down here, we didn't have a dairy barn. There was three old barns there that had been there for, I don't know how, when they were born uh, or born, built. Um, one of them... Um, Burr was on fire. We were in there one year, and that was everything was charred pretty bad. And if you had white cattle, they had all black on them if they rubbed against them. So the next year they tore that down, and we were in a tent. And uh, and then the next year we put up the dairy barn. Um, and of course the horse barns. I was looking at a picture back in the fifties. There was one old horse barn there. Now we have four horse barns. Uh, when I first came, the uh, Horse arena was down toward the river, and I was back behind the the horse uh, barns there. And that at that time, that was an old landfill. Um, we cleaned that all up and filled it all in, and made the horse arena there. Of course, the fire station wasn't here. Um, that used to be where the midway was. So it's changed a lot over the years, and we've had to to adapt to the necessity as a mother of invention. You know, we had to adapt to whatever happened here so we end up moving the uh, carnival and all that kind of stuff but basically we're still um, doing a lot of the things that we did before just on a bigger scale can you uh, tell us about the the pool incident and the and the following issues about the bathroom well yeah we never had bathrooms around here that was one of the problems and uh, the first year I got on the board we took a house trailer and uh, made some temporary bathrooms out of them and put them up by the sewage treatment plant. And we had four showers, I think, in each side and four toilets and four sinks. And that was what we had to get up by with. Well, uh, a few years later, the, the uh, King Memorial 
pool over here closed up, and the building was just set there. So we talked to the city and got permission to uh, renovate that building. And uh, so we built a uh, big meeting room in there and then some big bathrooms to help uh, accommodate everybody at the fair. And that was, uh, that was probably the biggest project we ever took on um, at the time. And it was a couple hundred thousand dollars, I think. Uh, which doesn't sound like so much now, but back in those days, that was a ton of money. But we made it work, and it's uh, it's been well worthwhile. Ever you know, uh, it serves us well. So it also helps us with uh, off-season rentals. About when people come to the fairgrounds, they have different activities, and if you don't have good restroom facilities or shower facilities and that kind of stuff, they don't they don't stay. So it's uh, benefited us all the way around. Now, uh, you were elected president of the fair board. Uh, can you tell us about what changes you oversaw while you were president and uh, what you did while you were president? Well, um, when I was a fair um, president, I don't know. <laughs> a lot. I don't know. I'm aware to start. We did a lot of things different around here. First thing we did is we... Um, First big change I remember, Larry Highmore we got on the board with me and he said, do we got to uh, make a new horse for you? So we did that. And I said, well, we need bass restroom. So we made the, the portable one, you know. Ray Hawkins came on and said, you know, we got to have a place where people can sit down and rest. So we built a park over here, planted trees, and got picnic tables. And, and those are like the first things we started and from there it's just been building. Then we went to we went to parking and then we in, uh, improved our camping facilities and made that bigger. We get up to about three hundred campers now and, and then the parking we ran out of room so we started running the shuttle service for that and, you know, and we built. Uh, the swine was in sheep barn we tore that down and rebuilt a bigger one and now it's all swine because we outgrew it and um, the horse barns, we switched it over, over to, to uh, from tie stalls to box stalls. And, uh, and uh, of course, the sheep are all out in a great big tent now because we just don't have a place for everybody. Uh, it's just, it's grown all the way around. And, and uh, we got, uh, our auction is phenomenal. We got one of the best livestock auctions in the state. Uh, we have a lot of people that support us, that support the kids. Um, and that's what makes this thing go, you know. We couldn't, it's not a one-man band, man. It's a team team deal. And, uh, you got to have a lot of people working together to make it happen. And uh, we're fortunate that's what happens here. In your opinion, what makes the Lowell Fair different than the other fairs? Like, what makes it better? <coughs> well, number one, we're here for kids. We're a youth fair, and um, the commercial stuff is fine. And we bring it in, and we have people, you know, stuff for people to look at, and and all that stuff, but that's not the central idea of the fair. Our fair is, is for young people, and, and, and that's the whole deal. We're trying to um, give them an opportunity to better themselves, and uh, that's the, we we try to keep that in mind. And that, that's a uh, big. I have some some vendors here that travel all over the state or all over the country. In fact, they're from Florida and everywhere else. But and they say, you know what, you got a special fair, don't don't lose it. And that's what we try to do. We try to keep that in our mind all the time that that's what we're here for the kids. But this, this isn't the International Livestock Exhibition. This is a kid kind of youth fair. You know? So sometimes that's hard to do, but we try our best to, to keep on that theme. We know that the, the fair isn't the only thing that you do. We also know that you do uh, maple syrup stuff. Can you tell us about that? Like, how you got involved in that? Well, my cousin, uh, Chris, uh, he's been making maple syrup for, I don't know, 50 years or better probably. And um, he bought another farm and had another um, woods on it and he and needed somebody to help him. And that was about 20 years ago. I guess I helped him off and on way back when I was young. And, uh, so I got started with him and we've been making maple syrup ever since. So we, we got a big picture of the bush now. We have about 1,600 taps. 
and uh, and that's another thing we kind of do it the traditional way too. We we fire with wood and uh, we haul the sap of horses, and, and uh, but it's fun. It's to go out there in, in the spring and there's snow on the ground when you start, and by the time you get down, the flowers are coming out in the woods, and you know the summer's right around the corner. So it's a it's a it's a fun time. It's a kind of a lost art, and I enjoy doing it. So. And now we got the farmer's market here at the fair, so that gives me an opportunity to sell a little syrup and talk to people. So that's kind of a fun deal. You you talk about uh, just doing it the old way. Like how how does that process work? Like how does it, how do you get from the sap in the tree to the syrup on the tree? Well, the sap goes up the tree. In the winter, the sap goes down in the roots. The tree goes dormant, and in the springtime. Uh, maple trees are about one of the first ones for the sap to go up uh, up the tree and go up the park to bring the uh, food up to the, for the leaves and, and, and so forth. So you drill a hole in the tree and when the sap goes up it gets in that hole it drips out. And then you have to, uh, it's about two and a half, three percent sugar. So you have to boil the excess moisture out of it to get it dense enough to be maple syrup. So what you do is you just, uh, we got a continuous flow evaporator that runs into it and you have a big huge fire under there and you boil it and boil it and boil it and hotter than the dickens. And all the steam comes out so you get, when you get it dense enough you make maple syrup. And then you bottle it and you know, filter it and bottle it and all that stuff. So. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's, you can't, you know, um, northeastern North America is where you get maple syrup. There's no place else in the world, so, you know, uh, from about Minnesota to uh, the East Coast and up in Canada, from about Kentucky up to Canada, that's where it's at. Now, you lived in, you lived in, uh, like Michigan all your life, right? And um, why why have you chosen this place to live? Like, what is it about West Michigan, especially that you like over all the other places? Well, I grew up. Of course, I grew up here, so that's where you start. And um, and oh, I've been around a little, you know, not a lot, but I've been around some to other places when I was in the service and that stuff. And then I got some of my kids are all out of state, and um. But Michigan's a pretty special place. Um, one thing you got four seasons, and if you talk to people who grew up with four seasons and, and all of a sudden you get into some place where it's all kind of about the same warm all the time, they miss them. So I think I would probably would too. I, and I don't like it to be hot all the time. I mean, it's all right to have some snow for a while. And it gives you look look forward to spring and you know that. And I like Lowell because I like the people. Uh, we got a good group of people who live in Lowell. They, they help each other. They work hard. Uh, they make things happen. And that's the fun part of it. If you go somewhere where nobody gives a hoot, it's not much fun. Who wants to be involved? But you end up getting involved in a lot of things here because, because you enjoy working with the other people. You got good people. And it's, it's fun to, to be involved in things out there. I try to help Liz at the chamber, you know, with their projects and, uh, and that stuff because she does a good job and they're good people and they, and they do some good projects. We have the summer concert series, we have the uh, the parades that start down here and all that kind of stuff. So it's fun to be in Mall. I don't know if you guys understand that, but you live in a good place. Uh, Mr. Wanger, can you uh, tell about tell us about the plaque that's right there? Oh, this year, well, um, I've been honored to be uh, allowed to uh, serve the fair industry on the uh, Michigan Association of Fairs and Exhibitions Board for nine years, and uh, and I was the president for one year. Uh, there's 83 fairs in Michigan. We all belong to the association, and uh, and we have a convention every, every year, and uh, we have about... 1,400 people that come to the convention. And what we do is we try to stand up for fairs. Uh, 
on uh, what's happening on uh, legislation, uh, uh, try to get state funding for fairs. Uh, fairs are a really important part of, uh, of our Michigan's culture. There's uh, uh, millions of people that go to fairs every year, and uh, there's a fair about in every county in the, in the state of Michigan. So it's, uh, it's a part of our culture that affects everybody, uh, and the ones that don't know about them are missing missing the boat because there's a lot of good things to, to do with fairs. Uh, and one of the big things is educate people about our, our uh, food chain. we got the safest food chain in the world. And uh, there's too many too many kids nowadays that don't know where milk comes from or, you know, or whatever. So um, fairs are very important. And, um, and uh, I've been blessed to be able to work with uh, – a lot of young people and, and people at fairs and even be at the state association. So, well, the barns behind me here were uh, added since I've been here at the fair. Uh, the ones over here on the other way are some of the old barns that have been here uh, when I came. We've outgrown these barns, and uh, so we've had to add new barns. And uh, Mr. Wenger, um, these roads, have they always been here or are these new additions? Oh, I don't know. This road's been here as long as I can remember. Okay. And um, you said that they didn't have parking, so where did they, where did everybody park before that? Everybody parked just wherever they wanted, around the farms. Uh, now, of course, we got down the road here past that motorhome. Uh, in fact, we're even across the road on the other side of Hudson, and we have to shuttle people back and forth. So we have a lot more people here now. We probably have uh, 40, 45,000 people here during the week, so made a big change. When was the horse barn built, and uh, what is it used for now? Well, this horse arena was built in the early 80s. Um, and, of course, we have about oh, a dozen horse shows. Uh, summer here other than fair and of course a week of fair uh this thing is used six days in a row about non-stop and then on saturday evening uh, we have a professional rodeo here so uh yeah this uh this arena gets a lot of use and uh, uh, we have a lot of horses we have about 250 horses here for the fair so it takes a beat but it's uh How, how is the upkeep on it? Is, it? is it difficult to keep in shape, or do you keep renovating it? Or? Oh, no, this ain't too bad. We, well, we had to put new surface on here a couple of times, but keep adding to that. But it's, uh, it's not too tough. Uh, and we put new lights on it, and uh, we did the announcer stand since we've been here, that kind of stuff. But it's standard. Uh, always keep adding to that. All right, so Mr. Wenger, what are the changes in the horse barn since you've been here? And uh, what's what's the deal with this old barn? Well, the Wittenbach barn here, I think, was built in the 70s. And it used to be all tie stalls. We made it into uh, box stalls now. There's a guy from a barn here was built. The, the barn behind me here, the guy from a barn, was built in 2004. This is the latest addition. Uh, we got a little office here, too. Uh, for to keep the records of the horse uh, shows here, but uh, yeah, the horses have come a long way. We built a new wash rack there a few years ago, and uh, this is a busy end of the fairgrounds. So, would you say that the the horse shows are the most um, most like the most dominant part of the fair? Is that what well, you're no, not really. We got a lot of things. We got about 250 horses here, but we got. Uh, 250 hogs too, so you know uh, they're all important, and, uh, and uh, you know all the kids do different things, but uh, that's fine. I mean, we all we're all different, like different things, so we just try to uh, have a good program for all the kids. Well, these are the bathrooms we put in. Uh, this was the King Memorial Youth uh, or the pool building. The pool used to be out behind here, 
and uh, this was the changing room and so forth. There was actually locker rooms for Birch Field, too. And when we uh, talked to the city about it, it had a flat roof. Um, the roof leaked. Uh, five gallon pails all over with water in there. Uh, we put the new roof on and uh, renovated the whole thing. Put some uh, big bathrooms with uh, showers and uh, everything in it. And it's made a big impact on the fair. Uh, we have 300 campers here, and now they have nice shower facilities, good bathroom facilities. Also, on the off season, that um, we have people that stay here and camp here because uh, bring shows in and so forth because we got good facilities. So uh, it's been a lot of work, and we spent a lot of money on it, but it's been worthwhile. Been a good asset to the community here. So, Mr. Wagner, can uh, you explain the pictures that are sitting on the table? Well, somebody gave me these pictures. This was in uh, was it 47 or 48 when they had a big flood here. Um, and I've only seen it flooded here uh, like that, I think, one time in the last 25 years that I've been here. That was, uh, about four years ago, we had a flood. but um, so. And uh, this... That's the fair before all the improvements and everything? Yeah, that was way back there in 47 or 48. And of course, I read in that article there that in 48, it was only a three day fair. So, except they did have a rodeo here. Uh, I, I don't know the whole deal, but Curly Howard always used to have a rodeo here. But how many times he had that, I don't know. So, uh, we've talked about the fair and the maple syrup, and we actually went out and uh, looked at the fair. Is there any other uh, any other things that you want to tell us about your life or what you believe? Well, the big thing I guess is you gotta you know, life's too short. You gotta get ready to get along with people. Once in a while, they tick you off and try to run over you, but most of the time they don't. And uh, um, can you reap what you harvest? You know, harvest what you plant. I guess uh, if you try to be good to people. Most of the time, they're good to you. And you just got to try to sell them on what your program is. Um, if you want to make something happen, convince people that it's the best thing. You can't ram it down their throat if that doesn't work. But. You have a story uh, related to that, don't you? About something that happened in the fair? Oh, probably um, 40 or 50, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, one time we were going to redo the, or or the uh, beef arena and... Um, and I went to the uh, International Livestock Exhibition in Louisville, Kentucky, and looked at their layout. And uh, So I came back and just uh, kind of convinced the beef people that, hey, this was the best way to do it. And it went like clockwork. Now, I could have came back and told them how they were going to do it, and uh, they probably would have told me to stick it. But, you know, seeing that we all work together on it, well, that's the whole thing. you got to sell your ideas to people you can't. Jamming down their throat. So, um, what do you what do you plan on doing after you retire from the fair? Like, do you think you'll stick in Michigan, or do you think you'll? When I retire, yeah, um, I'd probably be dead because I'm I'm having too much fun with what I want to retire for. Okay. Um. Kind of I, ruined his question there. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. That's all right. Um. <laughs> and if you can't laugh, you got to be able to laugh once in a while because life is too short. You know? That's for sure. And I never tease anybody. You can ask the kids around here. So. <laughs> so you guys are fighting that out. <laughs> The Lowell Area Historical Museum is proud to sponsor Community Oral History Interviews. The Lowell Area Historical Museum educates, enriches, and inspires our community and visitors through the preservation and presentation of Lowell Area history. For reservations and more information, contact the Lowell Area Historical Museum at 616-897-7688.